Hey everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Healing from Trauma by Building for Health. I'm Jen Hawes, Partnership Manager at Island Press, and I'll be running the logistics today. Uh, I'd like to give you a little run of show, so here's what you can expect for today. First, we'll have Dr. Lisa Patel provide some opening remarks. Then Jason Corburn will do a brief PowerPoint presentation. After that, we'll have a session led by Dr. Patel. Then we'll open it up for the audience questions. If you'd like to submit your questions, you can do so in the GoToWebinar control panel where the highlighted section is. If you have any trouble with the technology today, you can send a note either through the questions tab or through the chat function. After today's event, we will ask that you please fill out a brief survey. All survey responses are read and used to help inform the programming that we create here at Island Press, so your voice really does count. This session will be recorded. Expect to receive an email with the recording in one to two days. This webinar is brought to you by Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher and so much more. In a world flooded with information, Island Press connects the right ideas with the people who need to build sustainable cities and protect the natural world. Island Press's mission is to elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions, like we're doing here today. You can learn more about us or make a donation to Island Press to support this work at islandpress.org. And I have some good news. It, for all USGBC lead planning professionals, you're eligible for 1.5 GBRI continuing education hours for attending today's event. To receive credits, you'll need to self-report the CE hours in your USGBC account. If you have another certification and are curious if continuing education credits are available for those, please submit your question via the chat or send an email to ipwebinar at islandpress.org. Participants will receive a certificate of completion after today's event. I'd like to introduce our uh, participants today. Our moderator is Dr. Lisa Patel. Dr. Patel is the co-founder of the Climate and Health Task Force for the American Academy of Pediatrics and sits on the executive committee for the AAP's National Council on Environmental Health. She is the new deputy executive director for the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health at George Mason University. Jason Corburn is our PowerPoint presenter today. Jason is a professor of urban planning and public health at UC Berkeley. He has single authored three books, Street Science, For the Healthy City, and Healthy City Planning. For the first 100 individuals who registered for the event today, we will also, uh, who gave their full uh, physical address, we will also be giving a copy of uh, Cities for Life, which is Jason's book that he published with Island Press. Catherine Catalano is on today's panel as well. Catherine is the Deputy Director of the Center for Climate, Health, and Equity at the American Public Health Association. Catherine is passionate about applying her skills and experience to affect change and bring stakeholders together to advocate for climate justice and equitable health outcomes. Dr. Natasha Jarnett is another panelist today. She is an assistant professor in the Christina Lee Brown Environ Institute at the University of Louisville Division of Environmental Med Medicine. She's also a professorial lecturer in environmental and occupational health at George Washington University's Milken School Institute School of Public Health. Additionally, she is on a variety of governing boards and steering committees focused on climate, health, and equity. Anna Ricklin is our third panelist. She is an AICP certified professional. Anna is a passionate advocate for healthy communities and is the first health in all policies manager for the Fairfax County, formerly at Fairfax County, Virginia. Anna oversaw applied research and place-based initiatives to advance healthy planning practices at the American Planning Association. With that, I will open it up to Lisa for some opening remarks. Thanks so much, Jen, I appreciate it. And I'll keep my remarks brief so that we can get to the highlight here, which is hearing from Professor Jason Corburn and the rest of our panelists. 
I wanted to start with a quote in the book that particularly hit a chord for this moment. Um, Dr. Corburn wrote, the changes in Medellin didn't occur by miracle. They were actively created and constructed by people coming together, despite their fears and differences and building a vision for a new future. I'm thinking of Buffalo, Uvalde, Tulsa, Philadelphia, just in these past few weeks. Before this, Las Vegas, Orlando, Virginia Tech, Newtown, El Paso, communities suffering unthinkable traumas from an epidemic of gun violence, a country seemingly divided on the issue, but perhaps finally coming together after being seared apart. What does it look like for us to come together despite our fears and differences to build a vision for a new future? Cities for Life takes us through three cities around the world, Medellin, Colombia, Nairobi, Kenya, and Richmond, California, and shows us hopeful solutions, each unique with some shared similarities in the role of intergenerational trauma, forced health inequities from structural racism, and income inequality, but also the deep wells of resilience, finding common threads that bring us together and building the social and physical infrastructure around it to strengthen and weave those threads together for change. Rebuilding our cities for health has always been important, but feels particularly urgent now as climate change will take each of these stressors of poverty, housing insecurity, environmental pollution, and interpersonal violence and make them worse. Take heat waves alone, already the number one weather-related killer. It is expected by the number of deaths from heat will outnumber the number from all infectious diseases combined by the end of the century. The majority of these deaths will occur in the poorest parts of the world. Heat is also a driver for poor sleep, exacerbates a number of health issues with those with chronic illness, will worsen food insecurity with failing crops, and evidence shows increasing epi episodes of violence and suicide. How can we put into perspective historic injustice, ongoing structural inequity and racism, and future stressors to build the urgency around reimagining our cities for health? After Professor Corbin's presentation, we're lucky to be joined by a number of experts in the field to discuss the stressors of climate change and thinking about health in all policies. As we consider cities for healing, Professor Corburn also points out the importance of how everyone, from doctors to public health officials to urban planners, need to rethink health and trauma. The field of medicine drills into us from the earliest stages of training a problem-based thinking model where we're seeking out the issues that need fixing. For many patients using that model, that list can be long. Drug addiction, mental health issues, housing insecurity. Professor Corburn discusses the importance of transitioning us away from this type of thinking, not asking what's wrong with you, but instead what's right with you? This trauma-informed approach seeks out strengths and opportunities for our patients, develops their agency for their own healing, in the book, Bessel van der Kolk is quoted saying, agency addresses trauma through the feeling of being in charge of your life, knowing where you stand, knowing that you have a say in what happens to you, knowing that you have some ability to shape your circumstances. As I read the book, I was reminded of a patient I cared for as a medical student on the HIV ward. She had been readmitted with an infection. And as I read through her history in the charts, I saw a very long list of problems. She continued to experience housing insecurity. She had been diagnosed with depression and anxiety. She'd had prior suicidal attempts. She had previously used heroin for her pain. She was admitted now because her white count was too low and the infection was starting to overwhelm her body. I was sent in to do a mental health assessment because one of her evolving problems was worsening dementia. I remember sitting across from her and asking her to perform task after task, which she politely complied with, but seemed to grow more agitated with. Each task revealed another deficit I dutifully wrote in my notebook. And then I asked her to write a sentence on a piece of paper as the last part of my neurological exam. She grabbed the pencil out of my hand, took my notebook and wrote, I am blessed in this journey. I never had the chance to talk to her again. She grew ill that night and was transferred to the ICU and died a few days later. But those words have stuck with me all these years to remind me that my patients are not a list of their problems. My patients are wells of resilience and it's my job to listen and, and empower rather than determine and prescribe. It's estimated that 50 to 60% of health outcomes in the United States are due to social determinants of health, the conditions into which we are born, live, worship, work, and play. And what does this mean? If we use our traditional problem-oriented lens that physicians like me are taught, it means mapping the food deserts and places of toxic pollution, like hazardous waste plants or freeways detailing the rates of crime in each neighborhood, understanding statistics for average income, health insurance coverage, rates of homelessness within communities, 
looking at the rates of high school graduations, that this is a predictor for an individual's lifetime of health. We detailed the problems, then mapped the solutions. And herein lies the problem. Professor Corburn writes, my research with communities revealed an all too frequent disconnect. Residents in poor and BIPOC communities were saying, I feel the stress of insecure housing, working two jobs in unsafe streets, while planners, public health departments, and healthcare professionals were saying, we have this program to help you get more exercise and improve your diet. The disconnect was not new for the poor and BIPOC who were often too, too often ignored and blamed for the traumas they experience, even though the origins of their stress are out of their control and arising from discriminatory and racist public policies and institutional neglect. But as he lays out, this lens of problem-based thinking that physicians like me are taught isn't just insufficient and counterproductive. It robs individuals of their dignity to point out the problems without considering the opportunities. Again, shifting us away from what's wrong with you to what's right with you. It starts by acknowledging that we need a process of healing that isn't just medicine or intervention driven, but healing centered. It understands that health isn't just something that happens within the clinic or hospital walls, but determined by people's homes and neighborhoods not just the built environment, but the strength of the communities in which we live. And our policies have a profound role to play in improving both social and physical infrastructure. This means supporting social connection, centering community experiences by co-creating solutions with them and by them. And it means ensuring things like a person's access to stable, healthy, and affordable housing within a neighborhood with strong community connections. What could this look like? So the story offers much needed hope in these times. And Dr. Corburn is going to be detailing these stories in his talk next. It includes the story of Elm Playlot Action Committee that took a dirt patch that one resident describes as likely having more needles on the ground than blades of grass and transforming it into a multi-use, multi-generational space based on community-driven visioning and design or park, park prescriptions by physicians for patients living in neighborhoods with higher levels of poverty and lower quality schools where they can join trips to a regional park with measurable improvements in their levels of stress by having that access to nature. The book provides so many powerful examples of what is possible when we prioritize people's healing by placing them at the center of their own destinies and providing the appropriate resources to support and achieve that vision. I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Corburn to tell us more about his book, Cities for Health. Okay, can folks hear me and see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, so appreciative of that um, introduction and summary and close reading uh, of the book. I, I really appreciate you for, for everything you said and, and also want to thank uh, Island Press and on all the other uh, panelists that I'm so excited to engage in conversation with uh, today and all those participating. I look forward to some hopefully um, provocative and, and challenging questions and dialogue on what I too uh, obviously am passionate about and feel strongly about that we need to rethink the way that um, we support communities from both a planning and public health and healthcare perspective. Let's see if I can, okay. Um, so I, I don't think I can summarize the key arguments of the book any better than Dr. Patel just did, but I'll try. <laughs> um, and so really the work is focused on, on what do we mean by urban health equity and how do we actually get there and who's the we when I say we who are the participants is a key question we often fail to ask but fundamentally um, city planning and some of our urban policies or public policies uh, and sometimes the lack of those policies have created traumas in our communities we need to be responsible for that as professionals in different settings and that these traumas create chronic or toxic stress which uh, as many folks on this panel and, and are listening in know already, has real biologic damage to our brains, our immune system, the growth of young people, the um, susceptibility of, of older people uh, to disease and even premature death. And this toxic stress uh, um, is not equally distributed, that many communities of color, the poor, are most harmed and have been for generations and that intergenerational trauma is still with us, both in our bodies, in our communities, and in the physical characteristics often of our communities. 
uh, and that our community driven assessments and solutions are necessary. And I'll say uh, a lot more about that in some of the examples from the book to address this, this stress and this chronic uh, ongoing toxic stress. Uh, and that healing really means focusing our resources on people, places, and the policies that have either created these traumas and those that can help us heal, uh, not one uh, or the other. And we need to really rebuild with communities, not for or on them. And this is the slide from Island Press. I know many folks are getting uh, a free copy of the book, but uh, they make great gifts or even bookends. Uh, so cities, fundamentally, uh, as I've argued and tried to argue in, in, in my career, can be healthy and healing for us. Uh, they provide can, can provide lots of opportunities from educational and economic to healthcare and services. And importantly, and very importantly for what I try to present in the book, are, are the opportunities for positive social connections. So those supportive relationships um, among neighbors, within families, within community or organizations or activities that we may ha have access to in our respective communities. And we saw how disruptive uh, that can be to our well-being uh, of, during COVID, of course, during certain lockdowns and social isolation policies and, and what that uh, has really now we're seeing to have done to uh, the mental health and even physical health of, of many populations, including uh, particularly young people. But the benefits of city life really depend on where you live in that city and how that city is governed. Something in urban planning and public health that sometimes we call urban malpractice, an image here from Brazil where the folks in the favelas on the left-hand side of the screen um, are often going over that fence to serve in the houses and clean the pools and take care of the children uh, uh, of, and, and do domestic work for the wealthy uh, on the right. So these vast inequalities right next to one another don't happen by accident. And we need to look at the sources uh, of these kinds of dynamics, this vast inequality where some have access to great resources and uh, opportunity and others uh, often stressors in their communities and in their, in their families. And again, the argument that social relations can help us heal. Now, the Institute of Medicine, all the way back in 2000 and then in 2010, again, reissued uh, uh, findings uh, in this report here on the left from neurons to neighborhoods. And I thought it was, for me, very influential to, to look back at some of this, that we really can't keep treating people, sending them back into the living and working conditions that may be making them unhealthy and leading to trauma and, and that ongoing stress in the first place, as Dr. Patel uh, so beautifully mentioned. That healing center at cities really invest, like I said, again, in people and places, reducing existing stressors and helping to support dependable social relationships. Um, and some of the findings from this work and many others what I've tried to build upon uh, in the book have, are findings that suggest that improving social connections and social relationships in community can have a greater health benefit than changing a diet, stopping smoking and exercising combined. It was pretty provocative, controversial findings, uh, but the power of social relations and social connections should not be um, dismissed, including how powerful social supports and also changing places again at the same time can even reverse some of the adverse health impacts of chronic discrimination and institutional racism. Again, controversial provocative findings, but I think important for us to think about as we, as planners and public health practitioners and others think about, you know, where do we invest our limited resources and where do we get the most health benefits and healing benefits uh, for our our investments. Now, as Dr. Patel mentioned in the book, I, I look in depth in collaborative work over a decade or more with community partners in three different cities in, in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, Medellin in Colombia, uh, and in Richmond, California. But in the interest of time and, and so that we have some 
uh, time to get into discussion. I'm just going to focus today uh, on on Richmond, and there's a couple of uh, chapters on on Richmond and some of the the nuanced work that's happened there. And I think it's a, uh, got a lot of important things going on. Again, all of these places imperfect change, but I think a lot of great lessons uh, for uh, to address trauma and rebuild for health. So for those of you who don't know Richmond, California, it's in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's kind of uh, across the bay from San Francisco, just north of Oakland. It's historically a majority community of color, uh, African-American, Latino, uh, Asian immigrants, uh, really strong history of immigration, industrialization, lowest life expectancy, unfortunately, uh, about 15 years ago, and also one of the most violent cities in America, top 10 in, in, 20, in 2007. Uh, in terms of gun violence, gun homicides. And the approach that the city took was how did they both address some of the structural causes of these poor health and social inequalities? Uh, and what can partnerships between government and community organizations and community members look like to transform this city into a healthier healing place? The first place they started, and, and my team with UC Berkeley was a participant in, in a number of these activities that I'll describe, and in the Q&A maybe can talk some more about that. But the first thing was to uh, not come in and say, hey, we've got the solution for you because we're experts from Berkeley or wherever, but rather, what can community members identify about what matters to them and their health? And so a series of community-based action research projects were launched. Um, not just by me, but by other partners and led by community organizations that had long been established. And one of the most important things that they identified was to really recognize the history of the place, the history that had often been lost or forgotten or unrecognized. And it had uh, things like the land that was stolen from Japanese farmers in Richmond, who were some of the most productive flower farms in the San Francisco Bay Area during a Japanese incarceration during World War II. They also wanted to recognize the legacy of segregated housing. During World War II, Richmond uh, and the federal government had the largest public housing program, worker housing built, because Richmond had a large shipyard or continues to have a, a large uh, shipping facility where many of the ships were built in the Kaiser shipyards, the same Kaiser that became the health care uh, and, and hospital uh, a provider, uh, was building war, uh, the war machinery during World War II. And much of this housing got built very quickly. It was supposed to be temporary for workers, but it was uh, two things, not just temporary, as we know, many public housing and social housing, uh, the people didn't just leave or move out quickly. They stayed for generations, but it was also highly segregated, racially segregated housing. And the part of the pushback and an important part of the story in Richmond of its transformation was communities organizing against that discrimination. African-American community pushing back against discrimination in the uh, shipyards, in the Kaiser shipyards, uh, labor organizing. The Black Panther Party started in Richmond and in Oakland, California to push back against police violence at the time. And people were pushing back and organizing against the housing discrimination uh, in Richmond as well. This is a powerful photo and there's a series of these by Dorothy Lang about the community organizing and impact of that segregation, that racial segregation in Richmond during the war period and then the post-war kind of depression uh, when many of the jobs left. And so building on this community history and, and narrative, uh, we began to ask current residents, uh, what were the things that they were concerned about? Again, not coming in with an agenda about what is what might health and healing uh, be in this community. And we did a series of workshops where people identified the kinds of stressors they were under from affordable housing to violence to environmental pollution uh, to the lack of adequate uh, services at schools, uh, food insecurity, a whole host of things. And we took that uh, community process and turned it into diagrams like this to really recognize that m many of the traumas recognized by community were supported in, in our scientific literature and linked back to this idea of toxic stress. So we often talk about the adverse 
childhood experiences, those ACEs that can impact our, our brain development and our bodies um, as stressors at the early life period. And what this process in Richmond really recognized was those adverse community environments, uh, the, what we call the pair of ACEs, the double burden that many communities were under, not just young people, but teens and adults of housing and lack of mobility and food insecurity and violence and housing and community space were key factors that the community identified as things they wanted to focus on. And what we took that as um, was that we didn't want general approaches to improve health equity or population health or community well-being, but that what we were hearing from community residents was we needed very highly targeted strategies to address those stressors what some folks have called urban acupuncture. Jaime Lerner wrote a, a very nice book with Island Press, by the way, uh, on this topic, which says, hey, we need a series of strategic, often neighborhood-focused interventions, but community members and residents need to be at the center of the decisions about what those interventions could look like. Uh, and the idea that they are highly focused means that they'll have a big impact and it could have a big impact on young people uh, or on those stressors identified by the community and that they're social and physically catalytic not just the built environment and finally they must really be part of a larger longer term strategy so we took this model uh, the toxic stressors the urban acupuncture uh, kind of concept and said what could we come up with in in richmond in collaboration with community members and part of that was also recognizing the environmental injustices that existed i mentioned the, the port you see on the left hand side this dark chevron refinery outline which is a the, one of the largest if not the largest petrochemical refineries in the western part of the united states sits in richmond and the red shading represents the highest risk the most environmental burdens and that's from both air pollution and uh, land uh, soil-based pollution, and the green, uh, the, the the less uh, toxic, and it not by accident. And why? And this is a pattern, of course, we see all over the, the in many cities. Is that those same red shaded communities were majority communities of color? They were the same segregated uh, housing where the segregated housing was during. Uh, the war period I mentioned earlier. And it also was the same communities where there was a concentration of gun violence. I mentioned the violence uh, in Richmond uh, a decade or more ago, and uh, really highly focused in one particular neighborhood called the Iron Triangle. Got that name during the uh, sort of more industrial time, uh, bordered by uh, three railroad tracks, which kind of uh, limited mobility, uh, but really reflected its proximity to the industrial parts and the, the port of, of Richmond. And this was where um, much of the violence and environmental pollution and was almost an entirely uh, community of color. So part of the strategy, the response was to bring health and health equity in particular into Richmond's policies and decision making. And it started with Richmond becoming the first place in California, the first, first jurisdiction to put health equity into their land use plan called their general plan and was the first health element in California, uh, which is legally required uh, sort of long range strategy vision for a city or county. And Richmond was the first to put a health element into that plan. And it really prioritized a set of strategies about how to work with community to implement a health equity agenda. Um, that was then uh, turned into something called the Richmond Health Equity Partnership, which brought multiple stakeholders from the school district to the county health department. This is a city uh, in Richmond that isn't doesn't have a health department, so, but they were leading really on a public health and equity strategy and eventually led in 2014 to, to them drafting and adopting being the first city in the United States, I believe, to adopt a health and all policies ordinance, which was a law that said, hey, every city agency now has to be accountable through actions, partnerships, and indicators on how they were gonna promote health equity and respond to these concerns that community members had, had raised. Uh, the health and all policies strategy had uh, six intervention areas around governance, around economics, uh, around uh, 
healthcare around full service and safety uh, in communities, uh, housing and built environment and environmental health and justice. And it had specific strategies with indicators attached to those strategies, so measures of progress. And every city agency, including the budget, was linked to, and their performance indicators of every agency were linked to uh, the goals, uh, health equity goals uh, within this HIAP health and all policy strategy. But gun violence really was uh, at the top of the concern, both for uh, community residents and, and community organizations and many others in Richmond. And reducing gun violence really became and remains uh, even today as we see. So, so uh, unfortunately, a key challenge for us to address community healing and health and equity, that the threat of violence really breaks down uh, much of what we do in city planning and in public health. Uh, people living in fear stop coming outside, they stop talking to their neighbors, they may stop even going to school. Um, when public space is feared, it becomes uh, over surveilled and over policed. And of course, that is not applied equally in our communities. It's disproportionately applied to black, black, and, black and brown young men often, and their families are most impacted uh, when violence occurs. Uh, so gun violence, is partially caused by and a result, I would argue, of unaddressed trauma, the notion uh, that hurt people hurt people. So what did we do as part of this strategy in Richmond? Richmond created the first Office of Neighborhood Safety or the first uh, Office of Violence Prevention. There are now many, many others across the United States. And this really said, we're gonna institutionalize peacemaking and peacekeeping in city government and take it away from the, the role of, of just a nonprofit or just the police department in particular. And the idea of this office was to hire formerly incarcerated community members who were often went to prison on a gun charge, who were from Richmond, but who came back to the community with new skills and new awareness about how to be a credible a mentor and, and, and to engage in and reduce conflict, interrupt gun violence, like you may have heard that has happened, uh, at violence interrupters, similar model in Chicago and Boston and New York and Baltimore. They started something called the Peacemaker Fellowship where they identified the most influential folks in the community that were likely to be engaged in gun violence or be a victim and gave them 24 seven mentorship services, life skills in an intensive 18 month fellowship. And the results are pretty dramatic. That uh, study found 55% reduction in gun homicides and assaults in Richmond. And of the almost 150 fellows, they call them, these are the participants in this program, 94% today are still alive with 83% no gun activity or arrests or injuries. This is Devon Bogan in the center who's uh, founded that program and leads that pro uh, led that program and now leads a program called Advanced Peace, which is taking this model to tens of cities around the country. And these are some of the fellows from Richmond. And this is James Houston on the left, one of the lead outreach workers, what they call neighborhood change agent. And they, they use that term neighborhood change because they really see that engaging with these young people who are at the center of gun violence, often traumatized uh, and needing support and service, they actually not just change that individual, but they can change the entire community and the entire neighborhood. And he told me that they offer an ecosystem of harm reduction, attention, services, opportunities, and resources to those society have deemed expendable. We invest in them and see them as assets. It's about loving them up with the product of that love, a reduction in gun homicides, and a healthier community for all. And again, here are some of the data, that dotted red line of where uh, the launch of this Office of Neighborhood Safety, and you can see the shootings and gun homicides going down and then stabilizing. And what we found just uh, in the last uh, few months is that even during the pandemic, Richmond did not see a spike like many other cities have, and that we're seeing, uh, unfortunately, across this country of increase in in, in shootings and, and, and gun homicides. Uh, and Maybe part of the reason is the presence and sustainability uh, and stability, really, of this uh, gun violence reduction program. These folks were out there even during the pandemic uh, in a socially distanced way, engaging with, with people in the community. And we also see in that Iron Triangle neighborhood that there's some 
corollary benefits when you reduce gun violence. We saw a almost parallel trend in poverty reduction and unemployment going down. And I could have shown a similar graph of median household income going up in the same community. So again, in reducing violence, healing uh, means also you know, supporting the communities that are traumatized, not just the individuals and not just focusing on the gun outcomes, but on the positive outcomes that can happen through this in terms of economics and community opportunity. One of the things we did with this ONS program is to look at how this is really a could be called a justice reinvent, a reinvestment, although it only costs the city about a, a little over a million dollars a year to run this program. Uh, in this was 2019 data, they presented pre prevented 16 firearm incidents. These were conflicts where guns were drawn and the outreach workers like James Houston, I just mentioned, got in the middle of that and prevented that conflict, which could have been a shooting or a homicide. And as we know from data about the economic costs, and I would hate to even sort of present this slide, but you know, th there's a lot of talk about, you know, is this uh, a policy issue? Of course it's a policy issue when we're spending millions on uh, shootings and, and homicides, the costs of, of the healthcare costs, the emergency response, the police and, and criminal justice costs, costing tremendous amount to society. So this program saving millions just in Richmond um, from preventing gun violence. Now the Richmond approach didn't just focus on violence, uh, focused also on reducing energy poverty and environmental stressors, uh, hiring local people to get new jobs, uh, to engage in the economy and have uh, greater opportunity, life opportunities. And this is a Richmond Build program that's still in operation today, also focused on putting free solar energy uh, on uh, low-income housing and multifamily housing uh, and reducing that energy poverty burden for uh, poor folks. There was also a lot of place-based work and community co-design, again, that urban acupuncture strategy. And uh, one of those cases I talk about in the book is this one called Elm Playlot, and uh, in the Iron Triangle, again, this was a little pocket neighborhood park that some thought was kind of the heartbeat of this neighborhood, and as young people had identified, had been taken over by drug dealers and uh, by uh, violence, and this was Elm Playlot in the Iron Triangle neighborhood uh, back in around 2007 or eight before the community had taken over. And in fact, there's a, a, a newish looking play structure there and the city had actually spent $100,000 to clean up this park and bought a play structure, I think, from some company in Texas and just put it in, in the lot uh, to, to make it more attractive. And this is what happened to it. Within days, it was covered with graffiti and uh, you know, pe people were letting dogs run and, and it was uh, occupied uh, by all kinds of different activities. And this was th what the neighborhood and the housing around that Elm Play lot looked like at the time when residents came together to, to really reclaim this space and reclaim this park uh, and formed a, an organization to mobilize to uh, say, you know, we're, we're fed up. We don't want the city to, to design it for us. We want to define what this this park can look like for us and take control over it. And that's what they did. They started to mobilize and survey residents and get ideas about what could happen in this space to create a safe and healing space. And one of the interesting things that the designers on the call will recognize is that they didn't come up with a, uh, you know, call the landscape architects or the, and, and come up with the, the perfect design from the outset. They came up with some community ideas and they built it in a real, what they call the pop-up park kind of strategy. Community members proposed certain things, and even the architects and designers said, that's a, that's crazy, we could never do that, or that's too expensive. They said, well, let's try it. So they tried it in a pop-up way. They built it temporarily, uh, and they watched as young people played and moved through the space. We have lots of examples of, of beautiful parks uh, being co-designed this way in a kind of incremental learn by doing of approach. And eventually they came up with a vision, a community vision for Elm Playlot, uh, which you see on the left, and really focused on uh, not just play activities for young people, but for all ages, uh, older people, exercise, uh, food that they give out now every day, um, 
from as a county a food distribution site, uh, clean bathrooms for folks in the community, growing food in, in a garden, uh, including they have a petting zoo, uh, it's, it's a, a stress relief, a, a meditation space. It's, it's really a very dynamic uh, place, all designed uniquely by the community. But importantly, the difference here was that they also were trained to build it. They didn't just design the space, but they actually constructed it, and today they manage it and they get paid to do that. It wasn't uh, a, a project of the city uh, or some outside uh, a firm, but it's residents who continue to maintain uh, and provide the services, whether it's this the food program I mentioned or the youth services or the exercise programs or the haircuts or the, all the kinds of things that happen back in this community. And that was important because it provided jobs and economic investment, not just the physical space, but an activity and healing space. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, Elm Play Lot by Pogo Park is the organization, really the heartbeat uh, of the neighborhood, bringing people together uh, in a safe and community programmed and managed way. And this was uh, one of our uh, projects was a photo voice with youth for them to identify stressors and um, places that kind of alleviate that stress in, in Richmond. And one young person took this picture uh, of a um, peaceful place, they called it, in a Pogo Park where there's a little stream and kind of a little almost meditation garden uh, and described it this way in their photo uh, where they uh, have a peaceful place uh, to that they know is there that they can go uh, and decompress. And some of our data suggests that after this health and all policy strategy, which had the, strat the activities I mentioned here and many of other things, People in, in Richmond, uh, and this is uh, Richmond's community survey, which is asked every two years about 100 different questions about quality of life and quality of the built environment and quality of, of government services. We began to see significant changes in positive changes in those responses about play, as a place to raise children, self-rated health, feelings of safety, uh, things like that, both in the Iron Triangle neighborhood and Richmond as a whole. So I'll wrap up there. I went a little bit over time. I was supposed to, sorry about that, but I hope we can have plenty of time now for, for, for discussion. Um, so just to sum up some of the arguments from the book about the importance of really thinking about co-producing expertise with a knowledgeable community members, not on or for them, focusing in on this often intergenerational chronic or toxic stress, and how do we reduce those stressors in our communities uh, with folks and not focus just on one disease or one environmental risk at a time. This kind of focused urban acupuncture idea where we identify catalytic projects with people uh, and projects that transform places. And focusing these projects on ways of improving relationships, social connections that can help heal. That our biomedical approach uh, has not been attentive enough to uh, building healthy relationships or changing uh, our traumatic places. And that really all of this, we have to actually rethink the way we do uh, and build evidence for policy, what I call a new urban health science, that public health and planning have failed to recognize their responsibility in this, and we need a new approach to assessment and action with uh, the cases that I've offered in the book as at least the start of a conversation that I hope we can continue now. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to some questions. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. And now let's uh, turn to discussion. Um, we're going to start with you, Dr. Jajarnit. So if you could help us jumpstart by talking about how certain populations are susceptible to trauma. Oops, turn on my cat camera. Um, how are certain populations uniquely susceptible to trauma in their built environment, um, especially as we're thinking about, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Corburn really, um, we, we talked a lot about various social and environmental stressors and, and how does climate change interplay with the, the stressors that he um, talked about during his, his lecture. Uh, thanks so much for this question and um, for the opportunity to explore some of these populations that are um, made vulnerable um, in this uh, threat of climate change. So the health threats are vast 
and um, we're all at risk to these health threats, but there are some groups that are more susceptible to these health threats. And climate change can actually be a threat multiplier for these populations, exacerbating some of the inequities that these groups already experience. Consider children. <clears throat> World Health Organization estimates that 88% of the global burden of climate change falls on children younger than five years old. So there's a, a heavy burden um, and toxic stress uh, and trauma that comes along uh, that can disproportionately affect children. But then there's also older adults and older adults are more likely to have chronic diseases that may make them more susceptible to the health threats of climate change. They also may be more socially isolated. They may not be aware when there's uh, the need or the opportunity to um, relocate when there's an extreme storm that's on the way um, or may not have access to air conditioning and know that they need to find air conditioning on an extreme heat alert day. We have impoverished communities and these communities may lack the resources to support infrastructure updates or to recover following an extreme weather event. Um, we also have communities of color that are more likely to live on the fence lines of industrial polluters. And the single strongest predictor of where polluters are located is race. It's not income, it's not education, but it's race. And people of color make up the majority of people that live within a small distance of hazardous waste facilities. Um, in addition, we have indigenous communities. These have close cultural and religious ties to the land and climate change is affecting their ability to hunt, to gather food and to pass these traditions on to the next generations. And then we think about extreme weather, people have better health outcomes the sooner the further that they're able to evacuate the safely, safety, but people that um, are living with a disability, they may have challenges in evacuating if they have mobility um, challenges. Um, and then we have undocumented residents that might not feel comfortable evacuating um, when, when there is an evacuation warning for an extreme weather event um, for fear of deportation or discrimination. And this may result in decision making that leaves them more exposed to the toxic stress of extreme weather or other climate exposures. Um, but I don't want to imply that these groups are not resilient. Um, I love how Dr. Patel um, pointed out at the beginning of this webinar about the resilience of the populations that bear a heavier burden of health and equity under climate change. Um, these populations have largely been making a way out of no way, and that's been demonstrated in Jason's book. Um, so I, I love the perception of looking to the streets for building climate resilience and starting from there. Thank you. This actually leads perfectly to, to my next question, which is for Anna, which is thinking about, you know, Dr. Jadornet um, laid out all the various populations that will be made vulnerable because of climate change. Uh, Professor Corburn talked about health and all policies, which, which um, Fairfax, it sounds like, as well as integrated that. Can you talk about um, health and all policies and the manager for Fairfax County and how was that title created and what are some of the outcomes and lessons you've learned so far in the work? Sure, and thank you for that question as well. So the role was developed after several years of groundwork by staff in the health department who recognized that if they really were going to be tackling these issues, housing, transportation, issues with the built environment, how we plan our parks, all of those things that we really needed to, that, that really are shaping our health, um, that we really need to connect with the players who are making decisions around those factors in our community. And so they decided to create the position uh, to be able to focus on that. Thus far, we've been taking more of an internal approach to uh, change through county partnerships, uh, working with county agencies across different sectors. Um, and so by having me explicitly assigned to work on that, build the relationships, track the land use process, um, and engage with the policy making that results in the new buildings and the new parks or the, the repurposed spaces, um, resource distribution, and if that, those resources are being distributed equitably or being um, seen as given to different parts of the county, not as equitably, those we know that those really shape our health. So, um, but I want to emphasize that our health director wasn't looking to build monuments. That's what she likes to say. She really was looking for 
a person and a position that will drive culture change. So we're not necessarily pointing to specific lines in a policy that say health should be considered or um, a particular bike lane or a particular plan even that promotes physical activity. We're really looking to shift how our partners in other agencies are thinking, how they approach their work, the kinds of data that they're using to drive decisions and inform decisions, um, helping them connect the dots so that they can see themselves as public health professionals because anybody who is shaping the environment really is a public health professional. So I really think of it as an approach, health and all policies as an approach that's of course upstream, policy oriented, but at the heart of it is collaborative, cross-sectoral, um, educational. I spend a lot of my time educating colleagues about health data, about health equity, about the different factors that have shaped health for different populations across our county, which is a big county and very diverse. Um, we just crossed over to being a majority minority county, as it were. So we have a lot of different needs across the county. Um, and so there is a, a critical need to focus on equity and inclusiveness and also being patient for the iterative change that um, we know needs to be the approach in a place that it has been used to doing things one way for a long time. Um, so I connect with folks on values, helping them see our problem as their problem, illustrating the problem, showing examples from other places. So I love the example from Richmond, California, and not just the inclusion of um, the health element in the in their general plan, but also having a health and all policies ordinance and what that has meant for the community, and then creatively linking to existing policies. So if you can't make a new policy, how can we connect to other policies or, or processes that already exist? So um, just quickly, over the past four years, I've engaged most significantly with our transportation and planning departments. I've also worked a lot with housing and the folks in the Office of Energy and the Environment who are working on our climate resiliency planning. I've seen several of my recommendations turn into policy language, but um, really it's most of those qualitative outcomes that I point to when I'm invited to participate in policy discussions about land use or be a lead collaborator on a conversation that's currently going on to evaluate alternatives to using level of service in transportation analysis, which we know has led to bigger roads for cars and less space and less safety for people walking and biking. Um, and then, you know, when someone reaches out to me and says they want my input on the on a letter they're writing to a constituent or a zoning case they're evaluating, or they request health data about part of the county that they're looking at, I consider those um, evidence towards that policy change, towards that culture change. Thank you, and that actually transitions perfectly to, to my question for Catherine. Um, so we've heard Anna sort of talk about this internal process, working across agencies um, to make sure that everybody is wrong for health. You're the deputy director for the Center for Climate Health and Equity at APHA. So you understand the challenges of engaging multiple stakeholders to move these policy levers around climate resiliency. What's a recent outcome you'd like to share as you've collaborated with diverse parties? Absolutely, yeah. I think. Um... You know, it, I'm so thrilled with this conversation and to be able to build on on these ideas. Working with different stakeholders across um, disciplines, across sectors, across uh, levels of understanding and engagement is so key. Um, as as Jason talks about in his book, you know, um, and and just generally in these spaces, in these policy spaces, you have much better outcomes um, when you're able to engage um, as many diverse opinions as possible. Um, I mean, for instance, I, and I was working, or you know, giving some advanced examples from transportation and infrastructure, and you know, um, we've been engaging with lots of diverse stakeholders around um, cities and investing in smart surfaces 
uh, to help reduce, uh, you know, the urban heat island effect and reduce temperatures in the summers in, in our cities that tend to be much harder, uh, miss much hotter with the, all the dark permeable surfaces, less tree cover, um, particularly in communities of color and low income communities and cities. And, you know, that kind of effort has us working um, in broad coalitions with different groups from um, environmental organizations to health organizations to planning and built environment folks. Um, you know, lots of subject matter experts coming together to build tools that communities can use um, to build policy recommendations. But, you know, it's also important, you know, some of those coalitions will do community engagement in the development of their work, um, but communities need to be engaged along every step of the way. So, you know, cities and counties and states, um, you know, working with these experts need to make sure they're also building in more opportunities for community engagement along the way um, and participation and community co-design um, when, you know, talking through implementation of their climate action plans or their resiliency planning. Um, you know, working with all of these stakeholders is, is really the only way to develop solutions that are going to address um, these health burdens of, of climate and other, other traumas in our cities, but also um, reduce the disparities and the inequities uh, between those. So, you know, I think, um, Smart services just being one example. Uh, there are so many different investments and and regulations and policy levers at city, state, you know, all, all different levels of policy making. And I think, um, you know, these these larger ambitious climate action plans at all levels. I think north of 400 cities and counties across the country have them um, is one like great opportunity to just sort of summarize all of these opportunities. Um, but the implementation of each and every, you know, proposed solution, the design and the implementation of every solution requires a lot of stakeholder engage engagement, which is just tons of time and effort, but it will always prove to be worth it. Great, thank you for all these great examples. And so we've talked sort of about health and policy. I, I wanna turn the conversation back to you, Professor Corburn, and sort of thinking about, you, you've talked about the biomedical approach and, and how it's it's pretty insufficient um, in, as we're thinking about them, built environmental trauma. What other interventions can be taken to help address these issues? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks everybody. I really enjoyed this. I mean, I, I um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is is ensuring that we stop looking at community engagement as a form of volunteerism or just um, stakeholder participation, but actually see it as as valuable work. And and in that sense, we need to compensate people for their expertise as much as we all as professionals get compensated. Uh, I think that's a fundamental difference that would reshape the way we think about climate action plans, for example, which are critically important uh, and, and really start to embody what it might mean to focus on climate justice, which means you know, giving those communities who have been divested from the resources to reshape their communities. I gave you the example of Elm Playlot and Pogo Park. Now, they, they did a lot of community engagement and action research, and they did what we as planners hopefully would be called good practice, at least for my students, you know, community participation, listening, co-creating, co-designing a, a new space. Uh, but they didn't, that was the beginning, not the end of the process. So I think the, the, the next steps were giving people the skill set to actually do the work to construct the park and build it, to weld it, to construct it. And those new skills, uh, as I talk about in the book, have now spun off into a new company that the nonprofit created with community residents benefiting from that. And the housing that I showed that was boarded up around that park is now owned by people who are getting the economic benefits of those skills and those jobs. They're no longer boarded up. Um, they're investing in their communities in new economic ways. So I think we need to think, uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Patel, kind of as we train people to be real narrow specialists, how do we get them to back out and look at the relationships um, across different disciplines that, you know, an economic investment, changing poverty and economic, can actually happen in our processes of planning for healthier communities, planning for climate action. 
it, we don't have to wait till the outcome of that plan be implemented. The process, we can uh, redirect resources. Again, I think the, the Office of Neighborhood Safety is another example, uh, the violence prevention program I talked about, where we're hiring people who we had previously incarcerated because we recognize they have a skill set to reach those who may be difficult to reach, but who are at the center of um, and often the most traumatized in our communities. We're seeing that, like you mentioned in your opening comments uh, across the country of young people really struggling. Who's reaching them? Well, unfortunately, sometimes traditional institutions in our communities are not reaching those folks. Uh, and I think so we, we need to look for unconventional partners and compensate them equitably for their work. Um, and I think that can begin to open up these spaces. Uh, and again, like you said, it's not discounting the role of healthcare or services or environmental design, but it's recognizing its limits and that it has uh, one role to play in a very complicated uh, process moving forward. Uh, th those are all great points. And I'd love to actually hear Anna from you next because you're sort of, it sounds like in the beginning stages of reaching out across agencies and doing a lot of this work, um, as you are integrating public health event objectives into your county plans and building these projects to see results, what are some of the challenges you see? And, and I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, some of the, the points that Professor Corburn raises around um, how do you break down the silos? How do you make sure people aren't too narrow in their, in their point of view? And, and how is your office sort of thinking about community engagement? in the work. Yeah, so um, I, I like to talk about health and all policies as an approach, as I, as I just mentioned. Um, you could look up a definition of it, and then I like to talk about health and all policies in real life. <laughs> and I really think often this kind of work is very opportunistic. And so jumping on to, say, a policy process, a land use process that's already going and and figuring out a way to fit in. Um, it's looking at uh, other opportunities where staff in particular in the county are doing community outreach, community engagement, and hearing maybe not firsthand, but at least secondhand from those staff about what folks are saying about what they want to see in their communities and neighborhoods. Um, so it's got a lot of that qualitative element to it. Um, it's really relationship-based and so I've even had the opportunity to connect people within their own agency who they didn't know, who are working on different things like silos within um, sectors, right? And and using that, uh, relate those relationships that I've built to help connect people. Um, really being inquisitive, I think, is critical and asking questions and just asking why. Why are we doing it this way? Could we do it a different way? Have we thought about this other thing? Um, and keep coming back. And I think those are some of the, the same types of traits that we want to see in community engagement as well, is continuing to come back, following up, not um, just taking information and then leaving, but but continuing to engage. And, and from my perspective, that's lots of your small P kind of stuff. So there's the big P policy that the board, um, the city council, the state legislature, Congress adopt, right? And then there's all those small P's, procedures and practices and day-to-day -day work that we engage in that are, are just as important, I think, for seeing values change, seeing culture change. Uh, it can be challenging, obviously. We're a big county. We have urban parts of our county. We have suburban parts of our county, even quasi-rural areas, 1.2 million people. We have a lot of the same challenges of cities, but the sprawl of the suburbs. Um, so it's kind of hard to cover it all. But one of my biggest drivers is health equity and, and for the department as well. Um, and when it comes to trauma and climate change, we're working to increase community resilience, build upon the systems that we developed during the COVID response to plan for our own resilience. So we're working on a climate uh, health plan that focuses on, our, on the needs of our most vulnerable residents. We did a study in 2019 looking at folks using hospital data, looking at folks who went to the hospital for heat-related illness. And what we found was that it was mostly people working outside who were able-bodied and in you know young or middle age, not the typical folks you might think of who are going to be more vulnerable to heat. But if you're working outside in extremely hot 
and humid conditions, you're going to be affected. But they also weren't working in their own communities, right? They were landscapers and construction workers and folks who are working in other parts of the county that might have more resources than where they actually live. And um, so we're really thinking about how we can reach those people to connect with them, what their needs might be to be more resilient, what kinds of policies or protections we could put in place to ensure their safety um, as we see more and more hot days, as well as their families and what kind of vulnerabilities their families might be facing and why folks are exposed to those kinds of jobs and what other options they might have. So that's, that's an example of how we're um, trying to connect the dots and leveraging our internal work on health equity to really accelerate and keep the momentum going from the attention that we got in the pandemic to folks realizing about the importance of secure, safe housing when it comes to health. Uh, the transportation network and how our transportation network is so critical to a functioning community and who's reliant on different kinds of transportation. So we're really trying to build upon that um, and take this window of opportunity to bring that health and all policies approach to to wider set of group groups, whether it be the, our policymakers, our board, um, as well as the community and people who are making decisions um, at the community level, and connecting also with our schools um, because we do have a in Fairfax we have a responsibility to maintain health in schools, and we're really trying to expand that thinking um, as we are seeing so many. Um, social and, and mental health challenges in our schools as we try to support students. And again, thinking more broadly than just the students, their families as well, um, how we can really promote health um, holistically. I think you raised a really good point. I'll say um, what I have seen in my clinical practice in the hospital is that we're seeing a number of patients come in who, because the, the swings in temperature have been what they are, I, I took care of a, a teenager who was hauling brick for eight hours in 100 degree weather and ended up in um, severe kidney damage because he was 16. He's like, I'll be fine. And so there, there really needs to be sort of a two, two pronged approach here. One is doing a lot of um, education and awareness raising of what heat will mean for health, but at the same time thinking about our policies that can help protect um, outdoor workers who may not understand the susceptibilities as heat is growing worse pretty quickly. Um, and in keeping with this theme of heat, um, Catherine, I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about the smart surfaces work that you're doing. Um, how do those smart surfaces work and what actionable steps can city planners take to mitigate public health risks to climate disasters? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so smart surfaces uh, really covers a suite of potential um, infrastructure choices and investments that that cities can make um, that are really sort of instead of um, you know decisions they might normally make so when it comes to the materials that they're using to build roads when they're when it comes to roofs on buildings um, choosing lighter um, surfaces tends to reflect more of the sun's rays away from cities. Um, you know, choosing permeable um, materials for roads and sidewalks helps with stormwater runoff, um, you know, which is also an increasing concern as, as we see more and more climate impacts. Um, tree cover helps, you know, through evaporative cooling helps reduce um, temperatures in cities. Um, also, as we know, like trees and plants uh, help with air quality. So it, it, those smart, smart surfaces sounds very high tech, but it includes just trees. Um, so there's, there's a whole suite of, um, you know, choices here when it comes to thinking through city infrastructure. And, you know, we're seeing just generally, you know, as, as cities are making infrastructure decisions, especially this year, as all sorts of new federal infrastructure funding is um, flowing into cities, you know, there are these opportunities to really uh, think about what types of investments we're making, you know, um, are we just going to you know, and as Anna was talking about the difference between like the big P, you know, and the intentions of a well-intentioned policy, right? The, the federal infrastructure bill, you know, has some carve outs for, for climate solutions, is intended to help um, with, with equity through the Justice 40 initiative. But, you know, if, if cities take that and, and you know, 
focus on highway expansion, uh, you know, using the same materials they always have, um, you know, we're going to see vastly different results um, than if they were to invest in more green space, invest in smarter surfaces like the ones I mentioned, um, invest in more people-centered design um, over car-centered design. So um, all of these things are just really crucial decisions that cities can make. Um, you know, we've been working in coalition to help um, create tools so cities can look at different um, outcomes from these um, infrastructure choices that they're making um, and see what effect that can have on temperature, um, on cost, on you know full cost benefit analyses and then going and introducing them to planners in we've been working with baltimore um, for some time now helping them look at individual communities and also sharing with community organizations um, you know our smart services coalition um, worked and you know did some uh, collaboration with you know local baltimore groups um, so that they could you know, share with communities, you know, the, these different choices that their decision makers are making, like you were talking about with public education, that they might not have known about these decisions that, you know, folks are just like, they're just sort of doing what they've always done. So making folks aware of these alternatives and the difference that it can make in their lives um, and helping them um, make decisions about, you know, which of these outcomes they'd like to advocate for in their cities. Great. Well, I'm, I'm seeing a question that's popped up in our chat that I think ties in nicely with one of the questions I have for you, Professor Carburn, which is really thinking about uh, what does trauma mean? Uh, so, so the American Academy of Pediatrics has declared a mental health emergency, um, particularly in um, our, our adolescents, and thinking about um, what does trauma mean? And um, teenagers who are particularly affected by trauma, toxic sex and, and traumatic environments, how can we um, address their social and cultural expression that can help teens cope? Yeah, that's a great question, and you know, I, I, I'm not um, a mental health profession, uh, professional, but I feel like, um, for me, I mean, you know, th there's sort of a conventional definition, I guess, of, of trauma that I start out with in the book, more of uh, an event, say, that uh, overwhelms our body, our nervous system, altering the way we we might process um, in our brains and uh, even um, our, our our memory, and then gets into our, our our biology. So it's the imprint of a painful experience um, on our on our bodies. And I think what I really want to do is to to take that out of a clinical definition and start to think about it as what does it mean to be traumatized uh, and to continually be traumatized, and how that uh, is not often something we can. So even articulate necessarily as an individual experience because it's happening around us in our communities, in certain communities on an everyday basis in an intergener intergenerational way. And the, then that trauma begins to reorganize uh, how we function every day in our daily lives. Uh, we go outside uh, even not knowing we've got that armor up because we're in fear of in our neighborhood or uh, fear uh, in our school or fear in um, in our uh, you know what we might be exposed to, um, so it's it becomes uh, in the book. I really want people to think about trauma as something that's not something you can meditate your way uh, out of, uh, nor is it something that you know an individual practice alone will address. It's critical to get that individual support, and as you talked about for young people today. But if we don't also change that kind of atmospheric trauma that's around folks in their communities on an everyday basis. It could be in the home, but it's often in the neighborhood, in the schools, um, and that can be social and physical dynamics. Then that trauma is gonna, as you know, keep happening and, and not be changed. And we can't uh, rely just on in individuals to get the supports they need. So we need a kind of community of practice to think about changing this these kind of, uh, in, uh, atmospheres or you know this broader set of uh, dynamics that influence uh, the trauma that I'm talking about and so it's got to be policy approach it's got to be bringing uh, building places that uh, support connection and healing it's really centering healing 
in a way that we aren't doing because we're often centering health. I mean, we're even talking about health equity, but we're not talking about healing and then moving towards greater equity. Because I think the, the distinction is important because if we center healing, we recognize the history and legacy of inequalities that are imprinted into our bodies and need that needs to be addressed uh, before we can move and say, we're gonna promote equity in my view. So a long-winded way, I guess that's an academic response to def defining trauma. Um, but again, I think we need to you know, combine the importance of what we've learned in the biomedical clinical setting and move bro uh, more broad into this kind of atmosphere community setting. I'd love to build off of your comments and Catherine's comments and now turn uh, to Dr. DeJarnet. Um, if you can talk to us a little bit about, you know, Catherine sort of raised that there's this, um, all this funding flowing from the infrastructure bill um, and there are ways to really use that around improving, improving our cities for climate resilience. And Professor Corburn has talked about what the impacts of climate change are on our youth. Um, green infrastructure can be an effective intervention for climate mitigation that isn't expensive or resource heavy um, and it can benefit all people and particularly the younger generation. Um, what are some of the climate impacts children are uniquely susceptible to and what do you see as some specific interventions that can be used to lessen those impacts? Uh, thank you for this question and it's, you know, um, how we approach this affects the next generation and the next generations and the next generations and children have unique susceptibility when it comes to these exposures. So I am um, glad that they are part of the heart of this conversation. And so um, the reasons that children are susceptible, their organ systems are still developing until they're an adult. So exposure at sensitive times of development can have long or short-term consequences. Also, children are dependence on adults um, for their to make decisions on behalf of their well-being. So that also leaves them um, more vulnerable. They breathe in more air and they take in more water for their body weight, which this leaves them more exposed when compared to adults. They crawl on the ground. They have these hand-to-mouth behaviors that also can put them at greater risk of ground level pollutants or ingesting toxic exposures. And then also they can be exposed through chemicals that may be able to cross the placenta or travel through the breast milk. Um, so <clears throat> exposure to uh, poor air quality or extreme heat, extreme weather, flooding and drought, um, and even vector-borne disease, all of these can uniquely affect the health of children. So <clears throat> access to green space, this can provide a powerful opportunity to protect children's health and protect the health of adults as well. Um, this provides physical and mental health benefits. Um, tree planting is one that's discussed often. Trees can provide more shade. It can cool the environment. It can reduce our exposure to pollution in the air. And it can absorb water in the case of flood, or their roots can absorb water in the case of flooding. And access to green spaces, um, this can be beneficial to both children and adults. Uh, there are groups that are working to increase access to green spaces through neighborhood schoolyards. Um, there are also physicians that are providing prescriptions for parks. Um, and, and it's rooted in the research that strongly connects um, exposure to nature with health benefits. And so I'll share briefly about uh, one of the projects that we have here in Louisville at University of Louisville, and that's the Green Heart Project. And Green Heart is supported by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the Nature Conservancy, along with a lot of local partners, as well as the community. And the community called for action, the community called for more trees in their neighborhoods. Um, and so we have paired this with health. Um, so we, we understand that there's proposed to be these benefits. And so we're looking within our own community to see the benefits to health. So what we have is a randomized controlled trial where trees are the intervention. Now here we're looking at adults and we're planting trees and we're planting shrubs um, for healthier air. And we're looking at health indicators, um, namely cardiovascular health indicators and air quality levels before and after tree planting. So tree planting started in October of last year, 2021, and it continues today. But we're also now able to look at people before and after this tree intervention. So 
We ultimately hope that the Green Heart Project will provide an opportunity to establish roots as a healthier and greener neighborhood, um, but that other um, communities across the U.S. will be able to take this and modify this to meet the needs of their communities as other communities are calling for trees and increased green spaces um, as a way to protect their health, and beautify their communities. So there are a number of actions that have been shared that also help to address climate conditions, um, increase vegetation, cool roofs, um, roofs that reflect the heat rather than absorb the heat, um, restricting developing and flood prone areas. This can also be beneficial. Designs that better handle stormwater runoff, um, relocating buildings and areas that repeatedly flood. Um, but I'm happy to highlight uh, an example in green infrastructure to share with the group. Thank you. Great. Um, we haven't really talked about water infrastructure, and there's a question from our audience about that. And there was, I remember reading an article in the New York Times, I think it was about a year ago, detailing um, water infrastructure in a neighborhood in New York City that was primarily a community of color. And the water infrastructure there was so old that families had to actually install pumps because raw sewage would flow back through the toilets, through the sinks, through the bathtubs. And this is a, a problem primarily in communities of color throughout the country and sort of thinking about um, what the, this infrastructure bill could mean in terms of improving water infrastructure specifically in these places. Dr. Dijonet, you sort of mentioned, you mentioned flooding, um, which will be an increasing concern in many places, and, and these communities will be the hardest hit um, when these episodes of flooding happen, as we know, is coming with climate change. I'm curious, we didn't really talk about water before, but, but if anybody works in the space of water and, and wanted to jump in to answer this person's question around um, water infrastructure, health, and justice. This is an important question, and I'm I I am not an expert in water quality um, and water infrastructure, but I, I think it is um, as Catherine shared before. There's there's much opportunity here, but there's so much need here. There are infrastructure report cards on the U.S. that show that we have much opportunity to affect. Um, change in infrastructure and, of course, through through my lens to be able to do that to protect and advance health. And so and we know that this is so necessary and it's becoming even more urgent and more pertinent as we're experiencing more frequent flooding events, more frequent and more intense flooding events, a more 500 year flooding events. And none of us are the age that we should see multiple one in 500 year floods. Right. And when this happens, our flood water can overflow our um, uh, our stormwater can overflow our sewer water, and this can send untreated sewer water into our drinking water supply. Um, so infrastructure needs are, are, are there and are desperate in some cases because in many cases our water infrastructure in our cities is over 100 years old. Um, here in Louisville, we know that um, half of our water pumps um, are at their age of life expectancy. Uh, so I'm speaking to something that is right in my community and is very pertinent. But as I said, I am not a water quality expert. I'd love for another water, uh, a water quality expert to, to weigh in as well. Thank you for this question. I'll also say just, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just quickly, um, I, I do talk about the importance of water and sanitation in, in one chapter in Nairobi, Kenya. I mean, imagine a, a, a community in a city, it's really a neighborhood of 300,000 people, nine, over 95% don't have any in-home of running water access, so clean water or uh, sanitation, like a toilet. And so they, and, and this was particularly a, a gender justice issue because it was disproportionately impacting women. So I think when we talk about water, we also th have to talk about who's most burdened. Um, and again, uh, around the world, it's often women and, and young girls who are most burdened because they're, they're carrying that household burden for that you know, life supporting water uh, and sanitation service for themselves and their families. And so what happened though, uh, in, in the, book, I go through how as the threat of COVID was coming to East Africa and to Kenya, uh, seeing what was going on in, in, in other parts of the world, the community mobilized and they put up uh, emergency kind of washing stations when we thought that COVID uh, could be trans, you know, uh, uh, could be caught through um, uh, uh, surfaces. 
And almost within weeks, the government started to drill wells. And within months, a partnership between the community, government, and external agencies that had been working on water and sanitation development for decades, namely like the World Bank and the USAID and others who have the resources to improve and build uh, urban infrastructure, had uh, built pipes and connected homes. And all of a sudden there were flush toilets and there were hundreds um, of new water connections. It, it, oh, and so to me, it was not a, about a technology story. It was not about a resources story. We're talking about a place uh, like in you know many inner city or or places with aging infrastructure in the U.S. and around the world uh, had often complained that this we didn't have the money to do it. But it was really about the political will and the will to to value and humanize the lives of those who were they had so casually looked at as you know dehumanized and not worthy for so long. And to me, that's the story about water and water justice and a climate justice uh, approach is who's going to be prioritized. Uh, it's it's not a technology story to me. It's a political will uh, story. And the resources are, are actually, I think, largely there. It's how do we get them to the communities who need them the most. Uh, yeah, and to build on that just real quickly, another example on this political will piece, you know, when we talk about communities that um, have inadequate infrastructure, this is, you know, intentional disinvestment. This isn't, you know, this is historical. This is, we've known where these gaps lie in our infrastructure. You know, we've known where they came from for some time. I mean, when you look at, you um, the Houston area, you know, after Hurricane Ike in 2008, um, folks, you know, went around and, and did an analysis on stormwater management. And, you know, they pointed out that the majority of communities that still had these inadequate open ditch drainage systems were communities of color. Um, and the updated underground storm drainage, drainage systems were located in uh, wealthier white neighborhoods. And, Nine years later, Hurricane Harvey happened. You know, um, this was pointed out well in advance. This inadequacy in um, stormwater uh, systems between these different communities, and we saw the results of this disaster um, and so much more of the flood damage and the, you know, um, devastation from Harvey from flooding from Harvey did occur in those same neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, it's it's recognizing the problem and communicating about the problem, but also encouraging um, advocacy and really building up the public support and the political will to make these changes and lessen these disparities. Great. Well, we only have a few minutes left. What I thought could be um, great for our listeners is maybe one piece of advice you have for everybody that that, that came today um, to, to learn about health and all policies and how we create cities for health. Um, what what advice would you have for each of us that that are that are trying to do better, that are trying to to better center the voice of communities in terms of this work as we think about trauma informed care and climate resilience? Uh, maybe we'll start with Anna. Maybe we'll start with you. I was worried you'd come to me first. <laughs> so I really think that if truly beginning to understand the landscape of all the different players is probably the first step. So um, exploring how the different systems work, whether you're in government and you've never worked with other government agencies, learning about them and how they work, how they are looking at equity um, and potentially using that as a shared value since more and more government agencies are beginning to consider equity in their work, um, going to them and saying, we're also considering equity. This is how we think about it. How are you thinking about it? Finding something in common to connect on. And then if you're in community or resident um, and you're wanting to affect policy change um, or, or participate, there are many, many, many opportunities to participate in government that are left on the table. And so finding out what some of those opportunities may be and showing up, um, you really have an opportunity to be influential. Awesome. How about Dr. Deshonette? Uh, thank you. So uh, my recommendation is to keep your optimism. I um, have been somewhat judged, <laughs> judged for being an eternal optimist, but keep your optimism as much as you can. 
And one of the ways that I am able to maintain my optimism is um, finding community in this space of climate change and health. So I'm a member of several professional societies and a lot of local grassroots organizations that are doing work on this. So take what you've learned here from the book, from this discussion that we're having, take what you've learned from trauma-informed care and bring that into the community that, that you will identify with that will help um, to bring multiple voices together to call for action rather than just one. One can make a difference, um, but certainly multiple has multiple opportunity to make a difference as well. Thank you. Catherine, how about you? Yeah, I um, agree with our other panelists here and I'll um, add on a piece of advice um, that I try to, you know, bring forward every once in a while is to remember that we need to be ambitious at this point, um, you know, this is a crisis. And so often, you know, we're, we're told and it's reinforced that, you know, incrementalism is, is how you make change. And in a lot of cases, that's, that's true. But the climate crisis and, and these health impacts that we're seeing are uh, not moving incrementally and they are not concerned about uh, political will or, you know, so I just, you know, ask for more and maybe you'll get a little less than that, but you'll get a little more than they would have given you. Uh, so just stay ambitious, I think is a, one of the high level pieces of advice that I can offer. And Jason, we'll let you close it out. Okay, no pressure. Uh, love what everybody shared and thanks for everybody. Uh, stay humble would be my uh, suggestion. See the humanity in everyone and all communities around us. Uh, and of course, I couldn't let this one go uh, read the book uh, as my three recommendations. But again, thanks, everybody. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you all joining. Please fill out your survey and we'll send a recording out soon. Great day.